Sit back, it's time to get groovy. Question, do you remember that movie? Welcome to Remember That Movie. I am the third Alejandro Rosa on IMDb. And I'm Steve Johnston, not on IMDb, which means of the two of us, he's the famous one. That's right. <laughs> I don't know what I was going to say after that. But okay, let's just I'm go so with it. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. I will accept it. I'll accept the responsibility. Welcome back to our show. We have another movie for you guys. I have enjoyed this one. That's what I'm going to start with. I'm going to say, I picked this one. I did the research for this one, and I have enjoyed it thoroughly. I am very much looking forward to discussing it with you. I have too many pages in front of me, and so I'm going to be very lost. There might be the sound of shuffling pages, and I apologize in advance because I tried to rewrite my notes, but I didn't finish because I ran out of time, so now I just have too many pages. Okay, without dilly-dallying any longer, this episode will be about the 1982 film Grease 2. A film that came out four years after the original. Grease 2 came out June 11th, 1982. It was directed by Patricia Birch, who also choreographed everything in the film. It was written by Ken Finkelman. Ken Finkelman was an up-and-coming uh, screenwriter who ended up writing Grease 2 and Airplane 2 back-to-back. Ah. The film had a budget of $11.2 million. We will come back to that little factoid. Mm -hmm. Most of the music was by Louis St. Louis, but there was a bunch of other people involved with the music as well. And the film takes place in the very same high school, two years after the end of the prior film. So the prior film ends in 1959. This film starts on the first day of school of 1961. But, Steve, we cannot Sir. talk about Greece 2 just yet. We have to talk about Greece first. Very good. Most people are familiar with Greece, but just in case... You're not. <laughs> Grease is a very famous film that came out June 16th of 1978. It was directed by Randall Kleiser and starred John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John. Interesting point that I found out. John Travolta got this role because Henry Winkler turned it down. Ah, oh, okay. The Fonz did not want to be typecast for the rest of his life. But, of course, John Travolta took it and the rest is history. This film is an adaptation from the extremely successful 1971 stage musical, Grease. It was a hit on Broadway. It was a hit on the West End, if you're from the other side of the pond. It was huge. So huge that in 1978, the film was made. This film had a budget of $6 million. This will be important in a moment. <laughs> because, <laughs> Steve, how much do you think Grease made in 1978? The we're talking the original Greece, right? We are talking the original Greece. I happen to remember it somewhere in the order of like 350 million or something ridiculous like that. So you're half right. With a budget of 6 million, by the end of 1978, it had made $132 million, making it the highest grossing film of that year. Okay. Now, total box office, the money that the film made in its entirety was mm -hmm. actually $366 million. Ah, that, that was the number I was thinking of, yes. 90% of the music in the movie is from the stage show. There you go. That's Grease. And it was awesome. And things were going great. They made this fun movie. The cast really had a blast making it, Steve. And then guess what? They were excited. They were talking about, oh, can we make a sequel? Let's make another one. Paramount said... This movie is going to be a cute little summer movie. It's not going to make that much money. We're probably not looking at a sequel. And then Grease exploded, and it was Grease mania. But by the time that Paramount realized that they should really make a sequel out of this, it was too late. John Travolta had moved on. Olivia Newton-John had moved on. The director had moved on. Even Stockard Channing decided after Grease that she didn't want to do films, and she wanted to go back to doing theater. So think of this. You have Greece. You don't have the stars. You don't have the director. Jim Jacobs and Warren Casey, who were the writers of the music of the original stage musical, declined wanting to help out with a sequel. <laughs> so you don't have the music. Bronte Woodard, the writer of the original film, died. Oh. In 1980. And yet, what do you think Paramount did? Obviously, they said, well, we've got to make a sequel, so let's make it happen. No matter what, right? 
because right. it's going to be successful because this is huge and it doesn't matter if we don't have stars or directors or writers or musical people. No, we'll make another movie. It doesn't matter what we make. It's still going to be great. Patricia <laughs> Birch had choreographed the show on Broadway, had choreographed <laughs> the original film, and so they asked her to direct. And she agreed to do it, even though she was a little concerned because like almost nobody from the original production was involved. But she did it. So a sequel was born, and it was called Grease 2. <laughs> That's how this movie came to be. Was this the director's directorial debut, or had she directed other things prior to this? Steve, I think this might have been her directorial debut. I mean, she'd worked enough as a, as a choreographer, as a dancer herself. Um, so why not direct? So to kind of give us a, a concept an idea. I'm going to attempt plot in 60 seconds. I think you can handle this one. All right, here we go. It's 1961 and the first day of school at Rydell High. The T-Birds are back, the Pink Ladies are back, even Principal McGee and Coach Calhoun are back. We're introduced to Stephanie, leader of the Pink Ladies, and Johnny, head of the T-Birds. Enter overly British Michael, cousin <laughs> Of Sandy Olson. <laughs> of course, he immediately falls for Stephanie, only to learn two things. One, pink ladies date T-birds, not overly British gentlemen. And two, Stephanie wants a tough bike rider. A motorcycle rider, not like a BMX biker. I just want to make sure we make that clear. So what does Michael do? He starts doing people's homework for money so he can save up. And then he buys himself a motorcycle, which is in pieces. And then he slowly puts it together. And then he somehow becomes a mechanic. And then he learns how to ride that motorcycle. And then he gets really good. And then suddenly he's a trick biker. He can do all kinds of things. And so one night he shows up as the mysterious rider. He puts on a helmet, goggles, leather pants. And he has a deep American accent, deep voice, which made me think, is this where Christian Bale got this from? This is the origin of Batman. I am the Dark Knight. Hi, Stephanie. Want to ride and go get ice cream? Sorry, I got distracted. So, what happens? They fall in love. Of course, she and the mysterious writer fall in love. There's also a talent show going on. And, um... Stephanie falls for the mysterious writer. Everyone thinks at one point that he died. We have a talent show, then we have a luau, the bad bikers show up, because of course we have bad bikers and sort of good bikers. The mysterious writer appears, he's not dead! He saves the day, and then reveals that he is actually prim and proper Michael. And the T-Birds accept him, and Stephanie and he fall in love, and everyone sings, and then everyone graduates. That's the plot. <laughs> Also, there's a bunch of dancing and a lot of sexual innuendo throughout the entire thing. I haven't Googled the Christian Bale thing, but it could be true. It, it could very well be. He would never tell us. He might be a big fan. We don't know. So <laughs> let's talk about uh, real quick who's in this film, right? Because again, no John Travolta, no Olivia Newton-John. We needed new stars, fresh stars. There were a couple of people that almost made it into this film. Jennifer Beals was actually cast, but then dropped out so she could do flash dance. Cher was really interested in playing a role, but the script hadn't been finished, so she was like, nah, I'm out. But we did get some new faces. First and foremost, we have Michael, played by Maxwell Caulfield. He had done one film in England. Okay. And then he did this one. I think the director saw him in a play and thought, that's the guy. That's who I want. That's uh, who I want to play Sandy Olsen's British cousin, even though she was Australian. But we Brilliant, were not going to get yes. to that. So Johnny, leader of the T-Birds, Johnny Nogarelli, is played by Adrian Zmed, who ended up being famous for being on the TV show TJ Hooker. But prior oh, okay. to that, he had played Danny Zuko in the um, uh, tour of Greece, and he had played it on Broadway. That does not surprise me in the slightest. He had to adapt his Danny Zuko to Johnny, but I feel like that ab adaptation was very light. Yes. Goose Christopher McDonald, very famous for being in just everything. Breakin, Thelma and Louise, Happy Gilmore. Lewis was played by Peter Fretchett, and Davy was played by Leif 
Green. I don't know anything about those other two, and I apologize to those actors. But let's go to the Pink Ladies, because these are also interesting ladies. Mm, In the Pink yes. Ladies, we have Sharon, played by Maureen Tiffy. She was in Fame. She was Lucy Lane in Supergirl. Oh, okay. Rhonda was played by Allison Price. Dolores was played by Pamela Siegel Alden. She was actually 17. So sometimes they'd be filming and they'd say, where's Dolores? And they're like, she had to go home because it's two in the morning. She can't be here because she's <laughs> underaged. Paulette, our Marilyn Monroe kind of wannabe, was played by Lorna Luft, who is famously daughter of Judy Garland. I have a, a thing with Pamela Siegel Alden. I know her and I didn't know that I knew her because she's an actor. She's mm -hmm. a writer. She's a filmmaker. And she won an Emmy. And it's why she won the Emmy that I know her. And I, again, I didn't know this at all. She would go on to play Bobby on King of the Hill. Oh, my goodness. That's her. Total respect. She deserved it. That was an incredible yes, yeah. role. So when I was living in Hawaii at one point, and we were very poor, and we had a TV that only picked up like three channels, at night, we would watch King of the Hill. And it wasn't a show I was interested in, but it ended up being one of the only shows I could watch. And so I watched it and, and evolved into becoming a big fan. Okay, we're back. All right, so that takes care of the pink ladies. That takes care of the T-Birds. And, oh, uh, Maxwell Caulfield. I forgot something. Your random trivia on Maxwell Caulfield. And there isn't much. He is married to actor Juliet Mills, who is the daughter of Sir John Mills. Oh. Yeah, so anybody uh, nerding out on that? Go for it. I um, am, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you uh, be. No, because unless I am misremembering, do you remember last episode I told you I had watched a very depressing British cartoon? You, yes, you have. <laughs> John Mills, uh, I believe, provided the voice of the husband in that. That's fantastic. See, you just never, these all, the, everything's connected. So we got Mr. Maxwell Caulfield to be our new John Travolta. So now we need a new Olivia Newton-John. Michelle Pfeiffer walked into an audition. She was like, I'm not a great singer and I'm not a great dancer. I've trained in both, but I'm not very good. And she got it. So a very, very young Michelle Pfeiffer ends up playing our leading lady, Stephanie. Michelle Pfeiffer, eight-time Golden Globe-nominated actress, though she did win one of those, I believe, for the fabulous Baker Boys. She has won a BAFTA and has been nominated twice, and that one was for... Dangerous liaisons. She has had three Oscar nominations, two Screen Actor Guild nominations, one Emmy nomination. This was her fourth film. Hold on to your horses here, Steve. Yeah. This is not what's put her on the map. You don't say. No, it was actually the film that she did after this, because the next film that was released after this one was Scarface. Ah, yes. Where she plays the coked out wife, and that put her on the, on the map. And then she did Lady Hawk, and shortly thereafter, oh, yes. The Witches of Eastwick. This film is the reason that she ended up having as varied a career as she had. Mm -hmm. So she had already done a couple of films, mm -hmm. and after this one, she pretty much was like, I don't want to be just typecast as attractive woman in these movies anymore. I want to look for material that has more meaning, more meaningful, or interesting. And so that's why she took a hard left and went to Scarface. Hilariously, I believe uh, Brian De Palma, which I, who I believe is the director, did not want to audition her because he pretty much went, the girl from Greece too? No, thank you. <laughs> but eventually she got in there and she gave a killer audition. And of course, the rest is history. And she is Michelle Pfeiffer, the person that we all love. Or at least most of us. So there you go. This is our cast. This is our new class. What is your history with this film, Steve? My history with this film is rather brief. Because a couple, uh, about a week ago, someone told me that it existed. That's it. I, I did not know that this movie came to be until you mentioned it to me. <laughs> My personal history with this is, is very goofy. I watched this as a child. Um, HBO. Once, I was about once to again, ask, it's always HBO. HBO. They should yeah, be a sponsor. Right. <laughs> uh, Max, are you out there? It's me, Alejandro. 
Um, anyway, yes, of course, it was on HBO. And I probably didn't know at the time that it was Grease 2. I only knew it that it was that movie that had Michelle Pfeiffer. I somehow knew who Michelle Pfeiffer was. And also, there was a motorcycle in it. And there was a guy okay. doing motorcycle tricks. And I was, a, yes. I was a kid. So I was like, this is awesome. This guy's motorcycle thing. And that's all I remembered. I had no idea it was a musical. I had no idea it was the sequel to Grease. I was listening to some other podcast and the person was defending it. And then I heard it mentioned in something else months and months and months later. And it just got me thinking like, is there something to this film that I just don't know? I'm not a real big Grease head. I mean, I'm not, I, I don't have any problems with Grease. And so I thought to myself, well, that's interesting. Now I've listened to two different people mention this film and speak so highly of it, despite its reputation. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> let's do this, right? Let's find out. Let's, let's, let's dig deep and find out what is going on in this film. Let us start. I mean, I'm, we've already been doing this for a while, but let us start with the good stuff. Steve. What did you like about this film? I wish we still had video because the look on his face as he's trying to come up with an answer is hilarious. That kind of belies my answer to that question. It was very funny at, at times. There, there were some excellent gags. Wonderful. Okay. Okay. Um, excellent gags. Excellent gags. Everything else was just kind of... They're an okay. So just a general lukewarm reception from yes. the uh, the Steve side of the uh, of the aisle. I I I'm afraid so. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um. Anything stood out that you were impressed by? <laughs> <laughs> now he's laughing. Damn. No, I'm laughing because you are going to. I I think you are going to be amused by this answer. I'm ready. I, I very much like the use of the school buses in the opening number to block out the background because the buses were parked so tightly together so as not to be able to see what was behind them. At least that was my assumption. Wow. No, no, let, 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 me, let me think here. Because there, there was some good stuff. The choreography, the musical numbers themselves, while I was not a fan of the songs per se, I do have to admit that the choreography was spectacular in quite a few of them, in particular the bowling scene. Oh my gosh. Pause for a moment to say that on this, we are definitely in agreement. This movie knows how to dance. Yes. I actually thought that the numbers were, all right, Patricia Birch, rock on. You can definitely see the grease. I mean, are they, <laughs> you can definitely see the grease all over the yes. film. No, you can definitely see that this is the same person who made grease happen, who made those dance numbers in grease happen. There are epic dance numbers in this. The bowling alley is a great example. At some point, folks, they go bowling. Uh, apparently, this is a thing. Uh, interestingly enough, this was one of the things supposedly that got people interested in bowling again, sort of making bowling popular, this film. Oh. Supposedly. Don't know if that's true. Maybe that somebody just made that up on the internet and I just said it, so I'm just pushing it forward <laughs> as fact. Um, but anyway, they have this great scene at a bowling alley. They are dancing. I mean, they are dancing. They are jumping, sliding, couples, you name it. It's incredible. One of the cast members said, and I quote, we learned really quickly that bowling alleys were not made to be danced on. There oh. were at least five different twisted ankles. <laughs> oh, there were injuries. Johnny has a sliding moment where he slides mm -hmm. down an aisle on his knees. Uh, he actually said, we did that take like 50 times. Oh, During geez. the pandemic, I had knee replacement surgery and I 100% blame <laughs> Grease too. <laughs> okay, so great choreography. Yes. The, the, the music was... Okay. I don't think it was bad. No, no, it, it, it was not bad music. It was just there. I found myself towards the end of the film stopping and thinking, going, okay, what melodies do I remember? This is a musical, so I should be able to walk away humming a song of some description. And I could not come up with one. I remember the numbers. I remember that they occurred, but I could not remember how any of them went. Okay. All right. So anything else? Any performances that you liked? 
That, that's, that's a loaded question. Uh, because I liked the performances. I have no problem with the performances because it, it is a difficult craft and I do not wish to point at anyone who has acted in a film and say, oh, you did a bad job. But I don't really recall any standout moments. Really? Not even Mr. Stewart during the pollination scene? Oh, my Lord. <laughs> <laughs> there is so Ugh. okay so we have to point out that one thing that this one leaned harder on than the first one is on the fact that these are teenagers right these are horny teenagers and they really leaned into it when did we make this film 1982 right let's say 1981 yep. there was a that was a time period you see that a lot in some of the films so <laughs> the pollination song I actually think that that actor did a fantastic job. I yes, thought it was did. very funny. Uh, it was really over the top. And even though it was a little cringy in its, you know, it, it just turns into a sex talk. He's talking a about how plants pollinate. <laughs> He's talking about how the plants I, pollinate and the teenagers I, just I run with it. <laughs> sweat at the first two lines of the song. Not because of his delivery. His yeah. singing was fine. His characterization was fine. It yeah. was just like, oh, th these are the lyrics that we're going to go with? Here we go. Ooh, okay. Oh, I, I, have I can see where this is going. <laughs> but here's the thing. And it's... I was wrong because it went far further than I thought it was going to. Yes, yes. They did not hold back. I will say that it did stick with me as far as melodies go. I thought that was a great, horrible, great number. If you can combine the two, it was a horribly great number. The, the opening scene, the back to school scene, uh, is incredible. I, the first thing that I wrote down was so many dancers. Yes. Which goes back to something that I said earlier. This film had double the budget of Greece. So I think they could pay more people to be in it. Okay. Um, and I want you to know that I wrote something in all caps when off the bus comes our new leading man who is wearing a suit jacket, a sweater, sweater a tie. Vest. Yep. And uh, I wrote in all caps, I'm British. <laughs> yes. Everyone else is being cool. And he just comes out like, I, hello. I, I didn't write it down, but I had the same thoughts. Like, oh, he is so ridiculously British. <laughs> It was like I was almost I almost felt bad like oh man this is this is so much into a stereotype that I I feel bad <laughs> right because now now Steve's watching this and he's like thanks a lot man I um, was wondering if that had something to do with why you picked this particular film no no because that would have required me to remember anything about it <laughs> let's help the British guy look cool <laughs> in so, hint, Steve look this is what you need to do there are a ton of ridiculous things in this oh, yeah. Two of my favorite, most ridiculous things. Uh, one, the, the at, at, there's a time when we think the mysterious writer has died and Stephanie, a.k.a. Uh, <laughs> Michelle Pfeiffer, has this weird dream song and it, they're in, they're, it's smoky. She thinks she died, he died and it's all smoky and she's wearing like a silver dress and he is covered in silver on top of just mounds of broken motorcycles and they're reaching for each other. And he says something, oh my God, do I have it written down? Hang on. He says something along the lines of, keep our love alive, Stephanie. And I was like, didn't you guys meet like twice? Which was also at the same time, it was very teenagery, right? The love of my life, I shall never love again. He is the greatest. And of course, he's still wearing the helmet and goggles. By the way, yep. the actor begged them to let him take them off. Oh. <laughs> uh -huh. And uh, they were like, no, you're the mysterious writer. Like, no, she can't see your face. She doesn't know who you are. That's the whole point. Oh, by the way, uh, Steve, I thought about you during the bowling scene when uh, part of the songs is, we're going to score tonight. <laughs> oh, God, yes. <laughs> but anyway. Um... I, I have to admit to laughing the first time the chorus came up <laughs> because I, I was, you know, I was in for a nice bowling song and then they got to, we're going to score tonight. It's like, ah, yes. It was great. I'm sorry. That made me giggle. The other one was when our hero was sad and he was drawing hearts I think the song might be called Charades. It's called Charades, and I actually have a note on it. Please tell because... me what your note is, because it's... No. It's, it's My it, note it, is... It's the, Teenage Angst. <laughs> it's the Teenage Angst song. Yeah. 
And my note is that this song does not work. Hated that song. Hated it. But yes. What about Cool Rider? Which is one of the most famous songs in this movie. Cool Rider was good. No, I do not want to go have tea and biscuits with you. I want a Cool Rider. And then she goes into this huge song all by herself. And at one point climbs up a very tall ladder. Apparently uh, Michelle Pfeiffer read this and was like, really? Am I just going to be gyrating on top of a super tall ladder? Okay, I guess. And they said yes. Yes, yes, this is what we want. One thing that I did like. Now, this is something that this film did differently than the other film. In Greece, at the end, Sandy changes for Danny, yes. right? He tries to change for her too. But in the end, really, she's the one who sort of changes, right? Mm -hmm. In this one, our female character is very secure in herself and changes for no man. In fact, there are multiple lines that are very famous of her saying things like, you know, I'm no one's trophy. And at one point, even one of the other ones, Lorna, you know, she's trying to date Johnny and then he starts telling her what to do. And she says, I will not be bullied by another man. And so there's these, there, there are these hints that I'm just like, oh, that's really good. That's really yes. good. What are our, let's call it, we said the good stuff. Now we're sort of diving into the not good stuff of the quibbles. So mm -hmm. what would you say to that? Actually, before you answer that question, I'm going to ask you a yes. different question. Please do. Are you a Grease fan? Uh, I, like you, not a diehard huge fan. It's, it's, it's good. What didn't work about this film? I'm trying to think of how to put it into words. The story didn't flow particularly well. It's like we kept jumping from bit to bit to bit to bit. And I didn't get a real sense of the flow through of the entire thing. It seemed like there were several plot points that were mentioned and then never spoken of again. A big deal is made fairly early on of uh, Michael writing papers for the T-Bird members. I'm not sure that was ever revisited. Nope. It was just a vehicle for him to get a vehicle. Yes. And then they and just as soon as he got it. the vehicle, it was kind of pushed to the, to the back. Um, Another good example of that is actually D.D. Khan. So D.D. Khan was one of uh, oh, multiple yes. actors who came in and played their parts again. D.D. Khan played Frenchie, right? Principal McGee, uh -huh. uh, Eve Arden. That was her last film role, by the way. Sid Caesar came back to play uh, Coach Calhoun. And uh, uh, Dottie Goodman, who was the secretary, Blanche, uh, and several others. Um, but Didi Khan was brought in saying that she was coming back to pass her like science class that she, she didn't get to mm -hmm. finish. Frenchie is used to introduce our British fellow, you know, and kind of show him the ropes, tell him how the T-birds work and how the pink ladies work, kind of be the one friend that he has. And she's in the movie and then she slowly fades away. And we never actually really see her again. And, and then someone suddenly remembers, oh, wait, she's supposed to be in the movie and we get a scene with her. And then she's not spoken of for a while. And then someone in the script room said, oh, wait, she's in the movie. Quick, bring her back. And then we see her again for a brief period. I think she's in maybe like three or four scenes total. And that's I was just thinking if it? she's in the final scene or not when they're all graduating. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. So what I read was that because the script wasn't finished, mm -hmm. they, they, they had kind of her having a bigger part. And then as they wrote the script, they sort of stopped using Frenchie, which is why Frenchie's like slowly vanishes. And at one point, mm. I think they were, I think they almost cut her out entirely, but then they decided to keep her in okay. at least the bits because I think she didn't, she didn't finish all of the film. Right. Um, Dennis Stewart who plays Crater, Crater Face. He, oh, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Head of the bad motorcycle gang, the Cycle Lords. Yep. He was actually head of the Scorpions in Greece, the other bad. <laughs> yep. Uh, which, by the way, my favorite note about him is, is he 40? <laughs> because he is much older than all these kids who are not yes, kids yes, either. Is. The Biker Gang is another excellent example. They arrive unannounced in their, the first scene that they appear in. And then they, they appear once or twice else throughout the course of the film. And then at the luau scene, when they suddenly plow through the set onto the scene, I actually wrote down, oh yeah, I forgot about these guys. Because they're set up as the bad guys, but they're barely in it 
themselves. I will say that one thing that I really liked about this film in reference to that was that at the end of the day, these are high school kids, right? Yes. And so the T the T birds, which the principal always calls them T bones, and I keep doing that too. They very much point out that these are like four guys, four kids, and they think they're all big and bad. But when the actual motorcycle gang shows up, that has like oh. ten or twelve people in it, they totally turn into little kids. And I yeah, found they that fold very like a deck of cards, oh my god! Yeah. I thought that was so funny, especially <laughs> with uh, uh, Johnny. I really enjoyed that very much. How do you think? This film did. Based on the early discussion about Paramount dragging their feet and then things being started late so that we lost a lot of the original creative staff that made Grease such a big success, I am going to guess that this did not do particularly well. And I base that both on our prior discussion and my comment earlier that I was not aware of this movie's existence up until a few days ago. Yeah, that doesn't help. <laughs> um, well, you would probably uh, not be surprised to be correct. With a budget of $11.2 million. I'm bracing myself <laughs> for this. Grease 2 made $15 million. Ooh. Which is not good. Made its money back, at least. But that's not what these are. <laughs> these films are not made just to make their money back. They're made to make them rich. Right. Uh, yeah. So Greece did terribly, 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 terribly. And again, they had just made hundreds of millions of dollars off of Greece. That's why they wanted this. They wanted to keep milking that cash mm -hmm. cow. And here's interesting. Greece 2 was supposed to be one of several films and a TV and show. But once Greece 2 just flopped, they were like, oh, oh, no, never mind. We've just not made any money. People did not like this film. It didn't have the magic of Greece. It didn't have the people of Greece. We are going to go to a, a sage of the time, Mr. Roger Ebert. Oh, excellent. He references Greece as an affectionate memory of a Chicago high school in the 50s. His thing was that the Greece was anti-establishment, right? The, the, the Greasers, right. they were anti-establishment or whatever. And he didn't feel this film did that. But he had an even bigger criticism. He said, whatever you said about 1959, the same was for 1961. Nothing changed until the Beatles in 1963. After the late 50s Greaser and Elvis era, the most dramatic eras from a visual point of view, the Beatles, the late 60s flower power period, the Watergate anti-war period, and now the punk period. Grease 2 could have been about any of those periods. And instead, this movie just recycles Greece without the stars, without the energy, without the freshness, and without the grease. That is Roger Ebert's take on Greece 2. I read that before I watched the film. And then watching the film, and I completely agree. Mm -hmm. Here's what's interesting. One of the films that they proposed when they were doing, they were going to do multiple Greece movies. One of them mm -hmm. was going to take place during the 60s. Okay. But... They wanted to do that later. My biggest concern with this film is that it feels like a store brand version of Grease. Oh, that's a good way of putting it. It's not bad, right. but it's not the real brand stuff. You can tell it's not name brand. However, there are those yep. who stand by this film. Hmm. So one of the things that happened with Grease 2 is that it failed miserably. And then home videos started happening and it started getting discovered as a lot of our movies have been yes home video brings some movies back to life gives them a new audience and believe it or not streaming has given this a new life a new audience and there are some hardcore grease 2 fans out there they exist they have grease 2 theme nights very much like rocky horror where people okay. go dressed up in costume and they yell the lines. Some of the actors have actually been to these. Awesome. And, and said, it's so wild and so awesome. There was actually a musical adaptation of this in 2014 in England. And you know what it's called? 
Cool Rider. Of course. (laughs) There are people who support this film. They think it's good. I was going to say, I don't wish to be yucking anyone's yum. If you are a Grease 2 fan and you find some great enjoyment in it, fantastic. More power to you. It just did not do it for me. (laughs) Yeah. I'm going to tell you a couple of things and then then we'll get to our, our conclusions on this. Okay. Here's here's your random trivia. Ooh, I like these. The twins that are in the film, they are sisters who did not know they were cast in the same film. (laughs) One of them was cast in New York. One of them was cast in L.A. Oh, goodness. Okay. They showed up and they realized, oh, my God, did we accidentally cast twins? And then they had them adjust their hair to be identical. And then they actually expanded their roles to be twins. That's fantastic. Yeah, which is amazing. Michelle Pfeiffer. There is a scene when she goes with the uh, mysterious rider. There is a motorcycle scene where she is riding behind him and then she climbs and straddles him from the front while he's riding. That is actually her because it was 1980 something and people just didn't have rules and also she wasn't a huge star so it's all that she could say now. She still says, I can't believe they let me do that. It is an impressive scene, but when you watch it thinking, oh, this is really just a stuntman on a motorcycle and Michelle Pfeiffer, it is terrifying. Yes. Interestingly enough, the cast of Grease was very supportive of the cast of Grease 2. Awesome. One of the, um, oh, uh, the Preptones. One of them was actually dating Olivia Newton-John. Oh, yeah. And she came on set often. She threw a party for everyone at some point. Now I feel bad for not liking it. (laughs) (laughs) There is a scene that is a luau. It's a sunny luau. Apparently they filmed that in January in California. It was freezing. 30 or 40 degrees. Made all the worse by the fact that there are people who have to climb into a pool. Yes. One of the actors said, if you look closely, one of them is shivering. And sure enough, I actually looked... And there's, when they have, they're they're holding like a barge, right? Mm -hmm. And the the men are walking in, they're shirtless. And one in the very front, when he gets in the water, do you know how when you get into cold water, your shoulders go up really fast? You're like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Totally did it. Totally did it. (laughs) Uh, And I just started laughing. So they were freezing. And apparently when uh, Michelle Pfeiffer and Johnny are having their argument in the pool, Mm -hmm. nine, like a bunch of that was improv including the moment where he dropped his cigarette. That actually was real. He actually did drop a lit cigarette and they just started making up lines. Uh, The other thing I was going to say was uh, Lorna Luft, she really wanted her jacket. But Mm. Paramount said, no, you guys can't have the jackets. And then several years later, Paramount auctioned them off. And then years later, she was working on a show, a play. The stage manager said, somebody's here to see you. And this person had bought her jacket at that Aww. auction and said, it should come home to you. I was hoping that's where that yeah. story was going. So oh, see, and that was a fan. That was a Grease 2 fan. They're out there and they are strong. <laughs> okay, so yes, we have totally potentially destroyed this movie. But the thing is, Grease 2 fans are strong and they're used to it. They're not going to not like this movie just because two randos said bad things about it. So yeah, so that is Grease. Of course, recently, there was a prequel, Grease, Rise of the Pink Ladies, which took place four years prior to Grease. And there has been a film in the works for a while that has come in and out, production of writing or whatever, and it is called Summer Lovin'. What happened the summer before Grease? Very nice. As, As late as 2019, it was still floating about. Somebody keeps trying to make it. So we'll see. Could this be the end of Greece? I don't know. Maybe not. So final thoughts. I, I think this is not a terrible movie, but I cannot say this is a good movie. This falls squarely into the category of, I'm glad I have seen it. And having seen it, I have no intention of watching it again. There were parts that were good. There were parts that were funny. The acting throughout is is good for the most part. I do have one exception to that rule. I'm curious. What is your exception? Oh, I actually thought that the person who stood out the most as not belonging there Uh was 
Mr. British himself. <laughs> like the other actors had a joyfulness to them that he okay. just didn't have. He had he, like yeah, one he... good scene when he was with uh, little Dolores. And I thought, oh, okay, yes. so he's kind of a nice guy. Yeah. And then the rest of the time he was just brooding. And it even in the end, he doesn't look like he's having any fun. He's too busy being broody. British and broody. Everyone else is having a freaking blast. I, I felt like he was the only odd man out. And he didn't seem comfortable. And I don't mean that just because he's British. I just mean that the actor didn't seem comfortable in the role. He didn't seem like he was part of the same movie. To me. I was trying to figure out if his performance was the way the character was written. That because he is the outsider, no, he's not going to fit in. No, he's not going to be having as good a time as everyone else. And I had just chalked it up to that. Maybe. Maybe. I'm not sure. Now, per performance-wise, I loved it. I loved this, this gentleman's performance, but I did not like the character. And that was Johnny. I had an issue fairly early on trying to figure out what the story was going to be and who we were supposed to be paying attention to. Because at the end of the day, this is a love story between Stephanie and Michael. That, that's kind of the, the, the crux of the whole film, is trying to get them together. But we spend a hell of a lot of time following Johnny and his goons. For the first, like, half of the film, I was convinced that Johnny and Stephanie were going to get back together. Yes, she is pissed at him at the beginning, but by the end, they'll resolve their differences and that'll be them. And then we throw the British guy in the mix and I raised an eyebrow and went, oh, okay. So who is she going to end up with? Is the British guy this there, just there for comic relief? Is Stephanie going to end up with him? I found the movie to be muddled. I, I will tell you what it reminded me of. It reminded me somewhat of Meatballs, which came out, I think, uh, a year or two prior. Just in that you have some faculty who is very straight-laced and are trying to do things by the book. You have a bunch of horny teenagers running around that are doing whatever horny teenagers are going to, going to do. And we just cut from scene to scene to scene to scene with nothing really tying them together except for the fact that, oh, it's the same characters that are in all of these different scenes. Not it's, a great script. No, it's, I, I hate to say it, but it's, it's not particularly well written in terms of how it's put together. One of the, the other scenes that you mentioned earlier, and I, I was going to chime in and I should have, Stephanie's song where she suddenly does the the whole duet with ghost him in the the mist and the you mean ghost rider yeah ghost hey rider, thank you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what pulled me out of that scene what could have possibly pulled you into that scene it's horrible it was the realization that stephanie had stopped doing the rehearsed musical number that she and all the girls were involved with she sang a solo Wait, I'm sorry, she sang a duet with someone who was not there physically, but that song won her the talent show. How? Now, again, willing suspension of disbelief, but that's a stretch. Folks, what we are trying to say is that this film is not perfect. This film Far has its it. shortcomings. <laughs> Long comings, too. You know what? <laughs> it was fun to experience. Yes. I was very curious. The moments that I liked, I, I really did like. There were some standout performances for me. Patricia Birch's dance uh, choreography was phenomenal. Oh, phenomenal. Michelle Pfeiffer did an okay job. Sometimes I couldn't tell how strong the accent was going to come out. It depended on the scene. And I, I noticed that. I agree with her, you on her that Her accent fluctuated a lot. And I, again, this movie... Yeah. It's it, it, not one that I would recommend, but no. definitely one that I would say, hey, if you've never watched it, just to put it on your log of films, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Yes. Have fun with that. I would totally not watch it after watching Grease. Maybe watch mm. Grease after watching Grease too, to yes. try to comprehend, or at least you'll yes. be happier. You can find this, I believe, Paramount. Paramount Plus. It's available. As of the time of recording, yes. I had to rent it, but it didn't cost much. I think it was like $4 or something like that. So why not? If you feel like it after this glowing review, uh, yeah, go and uh, go and watch Grease 2. 
Thank you so much for listening, folks. Please, if you haven't already, leave a review on any of these wonderful podcast platforms. It helps get other people to hear about us. And have a great night or day or whatever. You're supposed to say bye to Steve. I, I know. I was trying to come up with something that you hadn't already said. Ciao. <laughs> Sit back, it's time to get groovy Question, do you remember that movie?